In the last module of this lecture, I'm going to explain how you actually measure and evaluate how well a given brain computer interface actually works in practice. And so that's the topic of performance evaluation. So say you had a calibration recording, um, like a person performing a task and you have multiple trials where a person produces EEG, and you use machine learning to calculate a BCI model on that. And uh, this model contains these parameters that you learned. How do you say how well it actually works? Well, um, that's relatively easy if you have another data set where you had um, where you had some ground truth on whether the person was in this or that cognitive state. Say, if the person was excited here and not excited five minutes later and so on. Um, because then you can take the model and just predict um, on the future data and calculate how well uh, uh, the outputs of that model correspond to the ground truth. And that is uh, the matter of loss estimation. So you estimate how um, basically the mis or, or, it or um, misfit between what you wanted to predict uh, or what your model predicted and what you know is the ground truth. So it's a measure between predictions and, and known target values. And there's various metrics that you can use. For example, mean square error measures the average, you know, offset from uh, squared offset from um, from the known labels and misclassification rate uh, is useful for um, for classification settings where you either produce you know where you produce a discrete output class one class two or so um, here's the two class case so that's a way to measure um, the average um, fraction of misclassified uh, fight trials. So that's what we're going to do. Um, you take your calibration data, you calculate your model, you test it on future data and calculate the loss. But now, what do you do <laughs> if you had only one data set? Um, sure, you can chop it up somewhere and, and train here and test there. But you've sort of only used a part of the data to test. And that gives rise to a procedure that is called cross-validation, where you split a data set multiple times and you say, um, OK, I'm going to test on this part, last chunk, and I'm training on all the rest. And then take this result. And then next run, you take another chunk, declare it a test set, train on everything else, and test on a test set, and cycle through until you've used every part of the data as a test set once. And um, there is one little caveat, and that is in the machine learning literature, you will frequently find that people perform randomized cross-validation where they are taking a random subset of trials, which is a test set, say, say 20%. That's a problem when you're working with time series data. Because in time series data, like in BCI, um, we know that nearby trials are very highly correlated. Say a person is sneezing, he's probably still recovering from the sneeze on the next trial. <laughs> and so um, you will want to test on data that your, your classifier, your model, has not yet seen before, um, because that's what it really has to do when you use it online, right? And so for this reason, we're doing it in such a way that the test set is actually a coherent block. Um, so it's blockwise cross-validation. And also, we tend to leave out a margin between training and test set of a few trials to um, really ensure that there's um, that you're not testing on data that you've already seen um, before. So uh, uh, that's margin topic. And usually, people do five-fold cross-validation, which means five splits, or ten-fold. So these are the standard ways. There's not much reason to go far beyond that. There is another benefit of this procedure, and this is the following. Um, if your model had a, a free parameter, uh, or if your method had a free parameter, that you couldn't determine based on um, basically in some kind of an analytic analytical way, such as a regularization parameter, say what frequency band is the right one, you can basically try out each parameter value and run a cross-validation to, um, to figure out which parameter set works best. Because cross-validation gives you a quantity that says, this is the average misclassification rate or so. And so that's very general because it works essentially with any kind of parameter. Although it can be slow if you have too many you know, basically choices to go through. 
And so on the training set, uh, you can cycle through all the parameters, uh, parameter values and, and pick out the model that ended up working best. And there is only one problem, and that is um, if you now, um, uh, there's some numbers associated with this best model, and that is how well it worked. <laughs> but if you report these numbers in a paper, say, that would be cherry picking. Um, you've systematically picked the, the best model that you, that you could find, and that's a number that you report. That's um, uh, basically scientifically flawed. What you have to do is you have to evaluate that model on some future data and take the loss on that data. Um, and that's the thing that can be reported. So, uh, and furthermore, if you don't have a separate data set, same story, you can take your data set and chop it up um, and basically do parameter search only on the training part. And that involves a little cross-validation that's running in here and then test on the test part. And, uh, and then cycle and declare something else to test part, do your cross-validation and parameter search on training part, et cetera. That is called nested cross-validation because now you have essentially two nested cross-validations running. And that is a, that's a general strategy uh, if you have BCI models which have free parameters that you need to optimize, but you still want to be able to quantify how well they work. The only trouble is that this is pretty slow because um, you might do the same calculation five times in here, times five times in the other cross validation, times however many values you have. So you easily run it 200 or 1,000 times. And that um, is already the most sophisticated in evaluation um, technique that's out there already. And that takes us to the end of this module.